The mission of the International Progressive MS Alliance is to accelerate the development of effective treatments for people with progressive forms of MS to improve the quality of life worldwide. As part of its work, the Alliance funds international networks of researchers and institutions that, working together, hold the promise of making breakthroughs in understanding and treating progressive MS. Our next speaker is the principal investigator in one of the Alliance's very promising research projects. Professor Francisco Quintana is a professor of neurology at the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and an associate member at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Professor Quintana is also the incoming president of the International Society of Neuroimmunology. Professor Quintana is a recipient of numerous awards for his work, including the Baranczyk Prize for Innovation in Multiple Sclerosis Research. Following his presentation, Professor Quintana will be ready to answer your questions, so be sure to enter them into the chat box as they come to mind. Now joining us with an update on the latest developments from the International Progressive MS Alliance, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Francisco Quintana. Morning, morning, John, and morning to everyone. It's actually a pleasure to uh, join at least virtually this great conference. Uh, so I'm sending you my regards to many of my friends in Spain and to John from here, from Boston. So what uh, I'm going to do today is actually uh, I'm going to talk about our recent developments in the uh, in the network that we established of international investigators, investigators from Canada, investigators from uh, Israel, and also from the uh, Boston area, in, in with regards of trying to identify novel mechanisms uh, that contribute to the pathogenesis of progressive MS, and while doing so, trying to identify novel targets uh, for therapeutic intervention. So, as you know. When we talk about uh, MS, we always think about deregulated, what we call adaptive immunity, right? We think about T cells coming into the CNS, uh, and, and once they come into the CNS, they recognize the target antigens, they cause actional, actional demyelination, actional uh, demyelination and actional loss. However, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that when they get to the CNS, they are also going to activate cells that sit in the uh, CNS are going to activate astrocytes and microglia. And these cells, they will trigger a second cascade of inflammation, a type of inflammation that is actually and currently not uh, targeted nor modulated by the drugs we have in hand. And we believe, is a belief of the community, that trying to understand, uh, first of all, how these microglia and astrocytes are being controlled will allow us to identify novel ways to modulate them and hence novel therapies for progressive MS. So my lab has been very interested in trying to understand the role of these cells and in particular one cell type called the astrocyte. Here you have a photo of them. These cells look like stars, hence their name, and they play important functions in the context of uh, homeostasis when, they, when we are healthy. These are cells that are going, first of all, they're the most abundant cell within the central nervous system. They're going to provide nutrients and metabolites for neurons to find, to, to function. Indeed, uh, one of the main roles is to support the metabolic needs of neurons. And in addition, they are also going to keep the blood barrier intact as a way of limiting what gets into the CNS. And one of the things I'm going to show you later is actually they are going to limit how inflammatory cells make into the CNS. Obviously, in the context of uh, neurodegeneration, in the context of multiple sclerosis, astrocytes will stop performing many of these homeostatic functions and will start 
uh, performing functions that directly contribute to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. They will recruit uh, peripheral inflammatory cells from the peripheral into the CNS, for example, monocytes. They're going to activate CNS resident cells such as microglia, and they're also going to have neurotoxic activities, intrinsic neurotoxic activities that will actually directly contribute to cell death. And one of the important things to keep in mind, right, is how is it that the same cell does these kind of beneficial, right, uh, homeostatic functions described in the left and these uh, um, pathogenic functions described at the right. Actually, one of the reasons to, under, or the reasons to understand that comes from very early studies, actually studies performed by Ramon y Cajal more than a hundred years ago, where using what now seem like very simple techniques, he was able not only to identify astrocytes, but actually to identify different subpopulations, sets of astrocytes that obviously in his case, he was only able to analyze from the morphologic, right, phenotypic point of view. But the idea I want to uh, imprint with you, to imprint in you today is the idea that probably these different subpopulations, right, now we can identify them and identify their specific roles in the context of MS pathology. And if we do that, potentially we would be able to identify novel targets for therapeutic intervention. So over the years, we've been very interested, obviously, in trying to characterize different mechanisms that control astrocytes under different subpopulations. And this is uh, part of our work. We have identified important roles for the microbiome, right? The gut flora in controlling uh, uh, astrocyte function, and I'll give you some examples later on. We've also found that there's a crosstalk with other cells within the central nervous system, in particular microglia, that it's important for controlling the activity of both cell types, but also in order at the end of the day to control neurodegeneration and, and MS pathology. And obviously there's a role for environmental factors, pollutants, for example, that can actually activate uh, or boost uh, the pathogenic activities of astrocytes and while doing so actually promote or exacerbate MS pathology. So just to give you a few examples of one of our recent, recent work actually supported by the Progressive MS Alliance, uh, some of our uh, findings on metabolism, right? Metabolism is, no, is known now to control multiple aspects basically of everything we do, of, of, of you know, we can think about the immune response and so on and so forth. So years back, actually, we made a very interesting observation we actually found that the metabolism of a specific set of lipids, right, which are called sphingolipids, the metabolism of sphingolipids somehow seem to be deregulated in the context of uh, multiple sclerosis, and in particular in its progressive stages. And that was important because that led us to characterize a very specific uh, signaling pathway, right, that operates within astrocytes and drives very important functions for, for CNS pathology. Uh, it drives the recruitment of monocytes, it drives the activation of microglia, it actually drives neurodegeneration all of those specifically driven by a sphingolipid metabolism uh, within astrocytes. Uh, and, and while uh, further exploring these initial findings, we were able to find that actually sphingolipid metabolism not only was driving all these pathogenic processes, it was, also, it was also interfering with the ability of astrocytes to support the metabolic needs of neurons. Actually, it was directly putting neurons in a bad uh, metabolic state that made them more susceptible to inflammation and actually made them more prone to die. So as part of studies uh, supported by the Alliance, actually, we went very deep in the molecular mechanisms that participate in this pathway. We were able actually to identify all the enzymes and the uh, genes involved in this pathway. And one point I want to highlight, which was very important, is that we identified that this mechanism, this mechanism of pathogenesis involves actually 
a whole set of proteins that are associated with the recognition and the immune response against viruses. So to cut a long story short, what we were able to find is that these metabolic deregulation in astrocytes associated with progressive MS, at a certain extent mimics uh, a viral infection in the CNS and then makes astrocytes give the pro-inflammatory response that in the context of viral infection would be protective, but obviously uh, in the context of MS drives new degeneration. And that's interesting if we think about, because it gives us a mechanism to understand how multiple viral infections could potentially uh, worsen uh, MS pathology. The other finding we made, which I would say is very important, is that while characterizing the specific, uh, the molecular mechanisms involved in this pathway, we identified one specific enzyme, one, en one specific protein that had been targeted before in the context of other diseases. In particular, uh, this protein here, UCGC, is actually uh, a protein that is targeted by megalostat, a drug that is already in the context, that is already in use in humans for the treatment of Gaucher uh, Niemann Pick disease. So the question, or actually what these finding proposed, suggested, is that potentially we could um, co-opt, use this specific drug, not only for the treatment of Gaucher, but potentially also for the treatment of progressive MS patients. So in order to address that, uh, what we did is actually we use a, a model uh, that resembles some of the mechanisms of progressive MS, in particular resembles the chronic deregulated activation of astrocytes and microglia, and we treated mice with, uh, with this specific drug, which as I mentioned is called Meglostat, and as you can see here, mice with um, uh, my controlled mice, they, they, they develop this, this very uh, uh, strong neurodegeneration, this very strong accumulation of neurologic disability. But treatment with this drug, Meglostat, was able to significantly suppress those pathogenic activities. And indeed, if we go, got to, uh, once we got to analyze the molecular mechanisms behind that, we were able to find that Meglostat was as predicted uh, interfering with this molecular pathway we identified. So that basically identified Meglostat as a candidate drug that can be repurposed and tested in MS patients, in progressive MS patients. As we know, the microbiome is now at the center. It's known to be an important regulator of multiple processes in the context of many uh, diseases. In, in, in addition, multiple, among them is multiple sclerosis. And indeed, as part of our studies, we were able to identify specific metabolites that are produced by the gut microbiome. And actually, they are produced by the gut microbiome from the uh, degradation of dietary tryptophan, which, as you know, is an amino acid that uh, we all have to take with our food. So basically, as part of our studies, we identified a specific uh, chemical pathways, if you wish, by which metabolites, chemicals produced by the gut flora can reach the central nervous system. They go into the circulation and from there they go into the central nervous system. And there they can actually control uh, signaling pathways. They control this gene called AHR specifically in astrocytes and microglia. And when they do that, they can actually suppress their pro-inflammatory activities. And indeed, uh, and that had multiple implications that described for the first time metabolites that reach the CNS, microbial metabolites that reach the CNS and act specifically on astrocytes and microglia to limit their pathogenic activities. The important implications about that are that actually that identifies for the first time what we call a gut-brain axis, right? That limits inflammation. And what is more important, we identify the molecular components that participate in it. We identify the signaling pathways associated to it, and that gives us the opportunity to study it better in the context of disease and also potentially start planning on, 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 on therapeutic interventions. And one point that was very important for us to find with regards to that was actually the fact that in the context of multiple sclerosis, this pathway seemed to be the, uh, dysfunctional. It seems to be less active 
And in the way we did that was actually to analyze in um, blood samples the uh, levels of these metabolites using a mass spectrometry method. So that suggests that actually if we activate this pathway, we might have a way uh, to, uh, to intervene therapeutically. That's one of our goals. And in some recent developments, actually in collaboration with Veit Rothhammer and his lab in Munich, Veit used to be a member of my group and now runs his own, runs his own group in Munich. We were able to identify how these metabolites actually to quantify how they are um, decreased in MS patients and in particular using three independent cohorts, we were able to find that they seem to be particularly decreased in the context of progressive MS and that seems to find or match data from other uh, uh, groups, for example, uh, the group of uh, Peter Calabresi here in the US. Um, so to summarize what I showed you before, I gave you just some examples of how metabolism and the microbiome kind of control the activity of astrocytes and microglia. But now going back to those initial drawings from Ramon y Cajal, what is clear is that these astrocytes and microglia are not homogeneous populations. They're actually pretty diverse, right? We remember, you might remember that I show you these different types of stars, right, that he used when drawing astrocytes. And indeed, there's implications that not only astrocytes, there's indications that not only astrocytes, but microglia, neurons, oligos, and other cells recruited to the CNS in the context of inflammation, they have different subclasses. So obviously the question then is to identify, can we identify those different subclasses to identify specifically which one of those are deregulated in the context of progressive MS, right? Um, so as part of those studies we established and, and as part of this large uh, consortium that I direct, we established what we would call a multi-omic study where we characterize with multiple genomic uh, uh, techniques, uh, samples uh, from the CNS of animal models and also from patients and basically we do single cell and bug genomics, we do transcription analysis. And at the end of the day, our goal is first to identify these different groups, different subsets of astrocytes and microglia. But we don't want just to be descriptive. What we want to do is to identify for each one of these subsets, the molecular mechanisms to control that control them, to identify the genes and the, the core genes, the, import, the most important genes to control them for two reasons. One, first we want to be able actually to uh, uh, dis perturb them actually to remove or hyperactivate these genes in vivo. And to do so, we use uh, this approach this, uh, uh, called CRISPR that has been uh, uh, developed a few years back. And actually, as you know, uh, those that identified it got the Nobel Prize a few months ago. So basically, we identify novel populations, we identify the genes that, it, that control those novel populations, and then we genetically modify them in vivo to understand the function of those novel populations. So we established that pipeline, and, and, and we're starting to identify what I would describe as novel and unknown subsets of astrocytes. So this is one of the first uh, populations we identify. This is how our data looks like. Each color represents a group of different astrocytes. We identify about seven of them. And when we analyze a total, this is actually data from MS patients, we analyze a total of about 48 samples, 28 of them isolated from MS patients. We identify a subpopulation of astrocytes which is expanded in the cortex and the cerebellum of MS patients. It's actually significantly expanded. And then we, with these studies, we, it's not only that we can identify populations that are expanded, we can actually get into the gene expression of each one of these cells, and we can actually try to understand what drives them, what makes them pathogenic. So one of the first things we identified was that they show a strong dysregulation of their uh, metabolism, and literally uh, that dysregulation recapitulates what we have described previously, we found that basically in the context of MS, astrocytes seem to have decreased ability to support the metabolic needs of uh, neurons. In addition, we also found 
that there's a specific signaling pathway that they have activated. It's a signaling pathway that it's known, it's, it's, it's called the unfolded protein response. Indeed, we have also uh, described this pathway in detail uh, about a year ago uh, in a recent publication. And what's important about this pathway is that we are collaborating with some pharma partners in order to target it therapeutically. They, but now uh, there are two important findings that we made that I would like to highlight. Uh, the first thing we did is we found that this specific astrocyte population seemed to be characterized by what we call epigenetic changes. Their genome was significantly, or the way that genome is wrapped and is accessible, right, in order to express uh, genes, different genes, seem to be uh, 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 affected in the context of MS. And that's important because that could create what we call a memory. Once these astrocytes gain these pathogenic activities, they seem to go and take a life of their own, right? And they will drive that pathogenic activities. And, and, and what is important then is to characterize what are the specific uh, genes that control those pathogenic activities. So we went deep into uh, our analysis, our bioinformatic analysis, and to cut a long story short, we identify a gene which is called MAFG, which actually seems to control in this, in this case, how the DNA uh, is accessible to be expressed. And that's important because that suggests that we need to uh, target to use a very specific set of uh, drugs that targets epigenetic modifiers as a way of targeting these specific set populations. And indeed, uh, we perform what we call a small screening in order to identify potential molecules that help MAFG to control the pathogenic activities of astrocytes. So the take home message is that we identify the specific subsets of astrocytes, which is driven by this specific protein, MAFG, in collaboration with MAT2. And this seems to have a memory of inflammation. Once you induce it in the context of MS, it seems to stay there, uh, promote new degeneration. And the second question, the second finding we made was that uh, was around the question of what controls, how is that these astrocytes are induced? And for our surprise, we identified that the cytokine, a specific immune protein, seemed to be behind that. But this is a protein that we thought was relevant in the periphery, not so much in the CNS. This is a protein called GMCSF, which was thought to control the activity of macrophages, monocytes in the periphery. Our data suggested that this protein was indeed driving the production of these pathogenic astrocytes in multiple sclerosis. And to cut a long story short, we, gener we generated a, a new strain of mice where astrocytes only are unable to uh, sense this specific protein, to sense GMCSF, and under those conditions, uh, there was a significant decrease <clears throat> in, 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 in CNS inflammation. And what was interesting to us is that when we did what we call in situ transcriptomics, right, when we analyzed gene expression within the CNS, keeping a location, what we were able to find is that this protein in particular that drives these pathogenic astrocytes is secreted by pathogenic T cells recruited to the CNS. And indeed, you see the more the T cells we see uh, expressing GMCSF, the more we see pathogenic astrocytes generate. So to summarize what I found you, what I showed you, we identify a novel population of astrocytes that drives uh, CNS inflammation and seems to be driven by factors secreted by T cells, by a factor called GMCSF. Once these astrocytes are induced, then they can boost inflammation and promote new degeneration. And then just before finishing, I would like to share two slides of, 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 of a new project, a, a, a new work that we now have in press. And basic, basically it goes back to the very same question. Can we identify novel subsets of astrocyte cells within the CNS that drive CNS inflammation? So for that, we actually drove, uh, performed an antibody screening and we identify a novel subset of astrocytes that is characterized by the uh, expression of a protein trail. Why is that important? Because these astrocytes seem to function in uh, under homeostatic conditions, actually in the context of health, basically 
to induce the apoptosis of, uh, uh, of um, pathogenic T cells. These are guardians that sit in particular in the meninges, the membrane close to the meninges, the membrane that surrounds the brain and limits its CNS inflammation. And just to give you an example, if we remove this specific astrocyte population, subpopulation, we get a significant worsening of uh, MS, of EIE, our preclinical model of MS. So obviously now our goal is working on trying to identify the molecular mechanisms that control this population in order to boost it. And to our surprise, and this is my last slide, what we found is that actually this anti-inflammatory subset of fastrocytes seems to be driven and stabilized by cells that are educated in the gut by the commensal flora. They migrate from the gut to the meninges in the CNS, and there they secrete factors that promote and stabilize these anti-inflammatory subsets. So here you have a population of astrocytes that we would like to boost as a way of finding new ways to treat MS. And with that, I'm going to, find, to finish. Basically, I talked today about different mechanisms that regulate astrocyte responses. First, I talked about sphingolipid metabolism and the drug that's already in the market which we could repurpose to treat, multiple, to, to treat progressive MS. Uh, we also identify a role for the microbiome and how specific metabolites reach the CNS and suppress CNS inflammation. And then actually we did deeper, we got, went deeper into specific astrocyte subpopulations and show you our new data on one pro-inflammatory and one anti-inflammatory astrocyte subpopulation that seemed to be relevant for the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. And our goal now is actually to develop, to identify drugs, to specifically target those specific populations. And with that, I'm going to finish. I want to thank, thank the Progressive MS Alliance for supporting our studies. And this work was driven by Chung Chai Chao, Fibrot Hammer, Mike Wheeler, and Liliana San Marco in my lab. And I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Professor Quintana. Um, when you mentioned identifying the gut-brain axis, we had a couple of questions pop up pretty quickly. People are wondering if now that we know that, can we begin to better understand or plan on how diet impacts progressive MS? That's an excellent, excellent question. And indeed, um, what we are trying to do is actually to take that to the next level, because obviously you can control the diet, right? But just to keep it simple, the way it works is, you know, the diet is actually taken by uh, uh, the bugs, you know, the microbiome and turned into chemicals that reach the brain and control immune function and inflammation. So what we are trying to do and which we believe are better drugs, if you wish, is on the one hand to identify those chemicals, to use them as drugs, right? that is easier to turn into a more uh, uh, designed and stable drug. And the other thing we're doing is actually to generate uh, synthetic probiotics, which are basically probiotics that produce well-defined and very specific anti-inflammatory chemicals to help uh, control MS. We had another question. Someone's asking if you could please explain what you meant when you said that the suppression of inflammation from gut to brain is dysfunctional in multiple sclerosis? That's an excellent question. So the way um, we would like to think is obviously we're in a constant balance between pro and anti-inflammation, right? We need inflammation, for example, to fight off pathogens, right? To fight off microbes to, for good healing. So we need a certain degree of inflammation, but that inflammation cannot go out of control. We all have those mechanisms that keep it under control, but and, and indeed this gut-brain axis we described seem to be part of those mechanisms that keep inflammation in the brain under control, they switch it off. What our data suggests is that one of those mechanisms seem to be dysfunctional or less functional in a subset of MS patients. So our goals are A, to identify those patients, 
and B, to identify um, approaches to boost, to reactivate those anti-inflammatory mechanisms. Well, thank you again. Always good to see you, Professor Quintana. Good to see you too, thank we you. Are, we are about ready to take a coffee break. During our break, you can check out the Icometric session that's about to begin and the meet and greet session that begins at 1115. You'll find a Zoom link for that in the chat area and you can get more information on how to join these sessions in the conference agenda. We will see you back at 1145.